the summer of 1963, a group of African-American parents packed a courtroom building in downtown Boston. It was a major school committee hearing, and the parents were there to disrupt it, to present the all-white administration with a list of demands. The demands included things like an end to discrimination in hiring teachers, an investigation into why Boston had no black principals, and a review of racist intelligence testing. Above all, they demanded that the committee make a public statement. An immediate public acknowledgement of the existence of de facto segregation in the Boston school system. The school committee feels this it cannot do. What kind of segregation is there? The segregation is segregation that is the result primarily of housing patterns. And this we recognize. We have said to the school committee, segregation exists. The fact that it is a result of housing patterns is another problem. The fact that it exists is the school committee's problem. The committee ignored the protesters, so the parents decided to pull their kids, 6,000 of them, out of Boston schools. They put them instead into churches, which had been converted temporarily into radical workshops called Freedom Schools. First of all, in our group, we discussed the um, segregation of schools and what exactly was wrong with them. Then we discussed what, what we could do. We said it, it, would, it would take a long time. It all goes back to housing. A new freedom struggle, which had been brewing for ages in the South, had finally found its way to Boston. See what type of resources we have in Columbia Point. None. We have none. And that's what we're asking for. Five thousand people with nothing to take care of. Nothing. From Jacobin Magazine, this is People's History. People from the inside experience love, tenacity, willpower. You're listening to our first six-episode season called The Point, Rebellion and Resistance in Boston Public Housing. The Point was not valued like it is today in terms of it being a piece of property. They're like, we want this property, we want people gone. Yeah. This is real intimidation. This is honest to goodness, you know, this is life or death here. The police invaded Columbia Point. So the men, they, they picked up the arm. I'm Alejandro Ramirez with my co-producer, Connor Gillies. And this is episode two, Grove Hall. In 1963, tenants at the Columbia Point project were fresh off a victory, getting the city dump down the street closed after a garbage truck killed a girl. I, oh, I have to go way back in my memory bank there. But yes, uh, my babies were small then when uh, the mothers was protesting to close the city dump. The area had been used as a dumping ground for urban renewal projects downtown. And I remember having one of my babies or two of my babies in, in a stroller, and we used to block the, the street that the trucks would go down to dump their load of garbage. That was what we did. We just blocked every morning, every day we get out there and block the street to keep those trucks from going down. And a lot of mothers had their baby strollers out there, but I was one of the ones with the baby strollers. Yeah. It worked. It did work. That was my first protest, was with the closing of the dump. And then um, I became more involved in the, what was going on in the Columbia Point area because um, now I have decided I'm going to be here. So I might as well try to do whatever I can to make it better for my kids and myself and other family members as well. When we closed the dump, it was just a community thing. Everybody got out to, you know, walk back and forth. People served, got made sandwiches, brought out food for you to eat if you were out there for a long time. Miriam Manning was another leader at the project. Yeah, I was part of that family. And there was a group of us that just kind of stood together. Our kids stood together up until today. Parents at the project, empowered and motivated by the protest, 
were able to successfully negotiate for better public resources, like a community center and a new middle school. I worked at the community center. I was the family advocate, and I went around when people moved in to talk to them about what was going on in the point, what they could do, how they could get involved. Trying to get the school, the McCormick School built, we got that built. So, you know, we decided the mothers worked. I mean, you know, as a group, not just one or two people. It was a community thing. Then there was Dorothy Haskins. In the early 60s, she started an ad hoc organization of mothers to agitate around the issue of welfare. The Columbia Point Group eventually linked up with a citywide group called Mothers for Adequate Welfare in 1965, and then with the National Welfare Rights Organization in 1966. We did a lot of things because we didn't have to, you know, go to nobody in Columbia Point for the things we were doing. We were independent. And it was the name of the organization was Welfare Rights. We were, we were an organization, Welfare Rights was an organization to bring the information to the community, to the residents who were on welfare. And we were a nationwide organization. I would call a general meeting for Columbia Point. And they knew um, I didn't have to specify welfare, you know, people who were on welfare. They knew what welfare rights stood for, for the rights of the people. It all started when a few mothers got together outside of the nearest supermarket. They used to sit at the supermarket with their table and used to have these buttons on welfare right. And they would be having enrollment. They was there every Saturday. You know, that's how that organization really started out and to the point, and it really, really stop went. Shop. Yeah, and stop a shop, it really, because it wasn't. This is Donna, Dorothy's daughter. She says her mom's greatest inspiration was Martin Luther King. We grew up, I grew up in the, in the, in the 60s. I grew up in the era of Martin Luther King. But I was still in the era of racism. I was still in the era of segregation. It was like, get on the bus, sit on the back of the bus. That's the era that I grew up in. That's the era my mother was coming out in the midst of all that. And it, her motivation was Martin Luther King. Yes, Martin Luther King was her motivation. When she yeah, first heard him speak. And my daddy. And um, peaceful demonstrations and stuff. Tenants elsewhere in the city looked to the Columbia Point mothers and started getting organized too especially in projects where people of color live. Other projects, okay, like Cathedral, Orchard Park, Mission Hill, they all started to come to them to see how they can group that community for themselves. And they all got it from my, from my mom, but other people that were there. And it was, going to house over her was like, every night it was a meeting. And if something was going on, they were like, well, we'll have an emergency meeting. With the new cadre of African American women leaders and a new rallying point around welfare, the informal tenant group known as Mothers for Columbia Point transformed and entered a new stage of organizing. I think we were just angry parents and was out to try to do something for whatever the cause were. I don't think we call ourselves a union or anything like that. That's it. That's what we would call the mothers from Columbia Point. The group's new leaders, including Maud, Miriam, and Dorothy, became the project's fiercest advocates for resources and rights. Mary Clark was another person, too. You, know, you got Thelma Peters and Erwin Shearer and Ruth Morrison, Amy Farrell. You know, it was quite a few. Above all, they instilled a belief in the project that anything was possible through self-organization. The mothers actually stood together. I mean, if, if one had a problem, we all had the problem. So we all tried to help each other. All of the mothers had a part of what was going on in Columbia Point. Burgeoning movements around urban renewal and school desegregation were growing to include a movement around welfare. 
In Boston and across northern cities, something was brewing. A sense that nonviolent tactics alone could not address issues of the city, like poor housing, police brutality, and poverty. In 1963, according to government estimates, one-fifth of the white population was below the poverty line, whereas half of the black population was below that same line. In cities like Boston and New York, black people were usually confined into low-quality housing, forced to pay high rents for overcrowded tenements. In the neighborhood of Harlem, for example, where artists like Langston Hughes and leaders like Queen Mother Moore live, tenants used direct action tactics to protest these poor living conditions. And this is where the urban rebellion really took off. Here's the historian Kianga Yamada Taylor. In 1964, this community organizer, Jesse Gray, led an entire campaign around rats as a, as a part of living conditions for Black people in Harlem. And part of that campaign included collecting dead rats and sending them to Nelson Rockefeller as a form of protest and showing up to housing court with plastic bags filled with rats that they would drop on the table in front of the judge to say, this is why people aren't paying their rent. I want to thank brother Jesse Gray. Uh, Jesse Gray is one of the key persons in the Harlem area, primarily because he's dealing with one of the key problems, the problem of housing. Jesse Gray was actually a close associate of Malcolm X. Across 1963 and 64, with a group known as the Harlem Tenants Council, Gray led a series of rent strikes to protest, quote, subhuman conditions in the black community. Hundreds of tenants across New York banded together, from the Lower East Side to Bed-Stuy. Here in Harlem, the reason we say that housing is such a, a key problem, when you live in a poor neighborhood, you're living in an area where you have to have poor schools. When you have poor schools, you have poor teachers. When you have poor teachers, you get a poor education. And when you get a poor education, you're destined to be a, a poor man and a poor woman the rest of your life. Poor education, you can only work on a poor paying job. And that poor paying job enables you to live again in a poor neighborhood. So it's a very vicious cycle. And usually these uh, uh, bad housing conditions result from the fact, as Mr. Gray has pointed out, of absentee landlords, people who are rich and live downtown and let you and I live up here in the shack. Actually, it's a form of 20th century slavery. Then, in July 1964, when a 15-year-old boy was shot by police, the unrest in Harlem turned into an uprising. 4,000 people took to the streets. But this is a feature of the mass of African Americans feeling that their demands were not being met by the civil rights movements. doing all along, but it was like during that time, those actions became, this is the last straw, we're going to war. We're going to have a revolt, not a riot, but a rebellion. This is Charles Pinder Hughes. He's a professor of sociology at Essex County College in New Jersey, where he teaches a course on Marxism and the Black Panthers. He was a Panther himself, and back in the 60s and 70s, he helped run a radical bookstore in Roxbury and spent time with friends at Columbia Point. Among Point residents, he's known as Cappy. And so, long before Black Power was declared, the, the anger of the Black community became more and more palpable. So that by 65, you had Watts, but you had dozens of other little things going on. In fact, in precisely the years of major civil rights legislation, people took to the streets in Cleveland, Rochester, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Jersey City. In August of 1965, the neighborhood of Watts in Los Angeles erupted in the most violent uprising since World War II. The event was provoked by the arrest of a black driver and the seizure of a young black woman falsely accused of spitting on police. The Negroes are stepping up, they're waking up, and they're going to do something about what the white man did to them in the past. 
There was rioting in the streets, looting, and firebombing of stores. We ride the cars, the white man was doing the Negroes unfair. They was taking what, them, what the Negroes had, all they had, to stop. You're not afraid of bloodshed, then? I'm not afraid of bloodshed. If I have to die for my rights, I will. Robert and Mabel Williams, the militants from North Carolina, were now in exile in Havana, Cuba. They started a radio show called Radio Free Dixie. During the turmoil in Watts, they took to the airwaves to support the rebels. The revolutionary people of Cuba sympathize with all people who struggle for social justice. It is in this spirit that we proudly allocate the following hour in an act of solidarity, peace, and friendship with our oppressed North American brothers. Here's the writer, Naila Orr. She covered the Radio Free Dixie story in a podcast for The Organist. American listeners heard a mix of radical black politics and the free jazz of Ornette Coleman, Nina Simone's Mississippi Goddamn, Lead Belly, Abby Lincoln, and Max Roach. and a young singer named Louis X, now better known as the Nation of Islam's minister, Louis Farrakhan. Get to work and root that stump. My brothers and sisters, we must face the hard, cold facts of life. Tokenism is a deceptive evil perpetrated against our brutally oppressed people to lull us to sleep. Williams's commentaries between songs were calls to action. Unite, organize, and arm for self-defense. Only a fool will turn the other cheek to racist beasts who set out to exterminate our brutally oppressed people. Human dignity requires us to fight back. In the spirit of 76, in the spirit of what, in the cause of justice and freedom, let our people take to the streets in fierce numbers and meet violence with violence. Let our battle cry be heard around the world. Freedom, freedom, freedom now of death. was being increasingly neglected. Housing was a huge issue in Los Angeles and certainly one of the precipitating factors. The year before, white voters in California had repealed through referendum a statewide fair housing law that had been voted into existence. The noose around black neighborhoods and communities draws tighter and it essentially institutionalized what some refer to as the dual housing market, a market where there are boundless choices, uh, housing choices for white people, and there are very limited and expensive choices for black people. By the time the rebellion was quelled, 34 people, mostly black, were killed. Hundreds more were injured, and 4,000 people were arrested. The event was followed by revolts in Chicago, Cleveland, Newark, and Detroit. I mean, I think that that was one of the lessons of the civil rights movement was that if you do all of the things that you're supposed to do legally, petitioning the government, actually changing the law, and nothing substantively actually changes in your life, then it raises questions about the legitimacy of the system, that all of the voting in the world all of the the marching and petitioning in the world didn't actually transform the material conditions in people's lives. And for for many people, it left the impression that really the only way to transform the situation is through revolting against the existing institutions. We were never fighting for the right to integrate. We were fighting against white supremacy. Black power became the new slogan among African-American youth. 
It was popularized in 1966 by Stokely Carmichael of SNCC. They've been telling you that the kids in Nashville started a riot. Number one, you ought to recognize it is not a riot, it is a rebellion. A rebellion. And number two, you ought to be proud of your black brothers and sisters at Fifth because a honky cop touched one of them and they told him you got to touch all of them. The government responded to growing pressure from the streets in a number of ways. The Johnson administration started a new agency called HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which provided housing subsidies. This was part of what Johnson called the War on Poverty, which introduced Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, and the Office of Economic Opportunity. In Massachusetts, the state government passed a bill requiring the complete integration of the Boston Public Schools. New welfare offices opened across several neighborhoods, including Columbia Point, which got an office on site in 1963. In 1966, an agency called ABCD, founded by the Ford Foundation, directed funding from the Office of Economic Opportunity into new social services and community spaces. ABCD was out there. They gave me space. They gave me office space. Additionally, Columbia Point was chosen as the site for one of the first community health centers in the U.S. The first health action program in America should begin at Columbia Point. It was just a very relieved feeling to know that it was going to be a health center up here that people could go to and they could pick their children to and they didn't have to worry about when their children got sick, how they were going to get them to the hospital or to a doctor. The center, which was also funded by the Office of Economic Opportunity, gave health care on-site, often for free, through the new insurance program, Medicaid. And there was a board, and the board was... From the point residents. One of the leaders on the board of the health center was Mrs. Haskins. Muriel Rue was another member. Of course, it, it was wonderful because now we didn't have to call the police every time we had to take a child to the hospital. And well, we had everything. We had a laboratory and a pharmacy, and we had everything. It was just a complete health center: obstetrics and uh, pediatrics, optometry, dentists. We had everything there. Through public housing coalitions, mothers set up health centers and other projects, too. Money came through, and we were able to reach over to Mary Ellen McCormick in South Boston. They started using the health center. Then we opened up a sub-health center for them over there. But they would still come over for certain things that they didn't have there. We had it in Columbia Point. The health center was maybe the community's biggest win yet. And again, it inspired residents to agitate for more resources. People thinking then, okay, now we got this health center, maybe the other things we could get here in, in the point. What else can we see if we can get in the point? Then we got the youth center, and that was a place that the kids could go and have fun and play and would have to play in the streets, which wouldn't matter anyway because there was nothing in the streets. And uh, so it was a relief. We got a store out there, and people didn't have to travel a long way to get bread and milk. But recent victories, like better social services or legal equality, did not transform the fundamental plight of most tenants living in Boston. People in the South End, Roxbury, and Dorchester still lived in rat-infested neighborhoods. Women in the projects still dealt with the bureaucracy of the welfare office, where guards and personnel often harassed the young mothers. Boston's long history of police brutality was becoming intolerable. Lincoln came and he set them free, but still we don't have liberty. We still don't have liberty. So now we're fighting one more war to make us free forevermore. Jackie Washington was an Afro-Puerto Rican folk artist from Roxbury. In 1963, he was a 24-year-old college senior who sang protest songs in local venues like Club 47. Then one night, out of the blue, cops pulled Jackie over and arrested him for, quote, being abroad in the nighttime. 
the police proceeded to break his nose and twist his ankle. The beating of Jackie Washington by cops became an important spark, provoking a storm of protest. There were large demonstrations. 10,000 people met on the Boston Common to decry police violence and also express solidarity with struggles in the South. That same year, people marched against school segregation. Thousands took to the streets in Roxbury, outside a dilapidated school, school building. Here, built in 1870. And then you see the Prudential Center rising above that in the back. This is what we're talking about. The difference, we're talking about the old and new boss. The Prudential Tower was a new insurance building that loomed over the South End. In many ways, the embodiment of government-sponsored urban renewal. Plans for redevelopment are widespread. Spectacular plans for the new Prudential Center. And along with these, new hospitals, schools, churches, apartments, and homes. Urban renewal was back with a vengeance, led by a new ambitious city planner named Ed Lowe, who now ran the redevelopment authority. Most disruptive of all was the plan to push out people of color in areas south of the Prudential Building. The aim, according to an official report from the Redevelopment Authority, was to replace people with, quote, middle-income white families. The South End, Roxbury, North Dorchester, and Columbia Point were all targeted. In fact, Ed Logue toured the Columbia Point housing project in 1964 as more people of color were moving in. His conclusion, quote, it should have never been built. Most northern cities now are engaged in something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Getting, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is an accomplice to this fact. The police operated as foot soldiers for this new wave of urban renewal. They didn't hesitate to drag families out of their homes, evicting them by force. City Hall formed a new riot squad, the Tactical Police Force, which acted as the armed wing of the gentrifying class. One liberal white family in the South End pressured a TPF captain to stop what they saw as a, quote, reign of terror, of purse snatching, and prostitution. It was the police kind of in conjunction with the other city services that enforced urban renewal. Um, and what's really interesting, you see in this period in Roxbury, the entire neighborhood was just left behind. And that, that's a feeling that many people had, a feeling of abandonment. And in terms of the policing of the neighborhood, in terms of the sort of stuff like trash collection, and the, the services like electricity, it was very evident that it was all being sort of shut down, almost in preparation for another urban renewal project. Simon Perdue is a researcher at Northeastern University with a particular focus on urban rebellion in Roxbury. He says residents in neighborhoods targeted for urban renewal felt that the police had abandoned them. When police did come in, they used violence. Their presence on the streets felt more like an occupation to many people. With the segregation of neighborhoods, um, there was a very different approach in policing. Sort of more affluent white neighborhoods were policed in a much more friendly manner, if that makes sense. Whereas, as I said, in, in neighborhoods like Roxbury, the police presence felt more like a military occupation. This was happening in cities all over. While President Johnson had begun making concessions through his war on poverty, at the same time, the Democratic president had started another war, the War on Crime. This punitive turn began in earnest in 1965, partly in response to Watts. Johnson funded new police, prisons, military-grade weapons, and riot squads like the TPF. Police suddenly were carrying large automatic weapons. Uh, they were driving armored vehicles. It was, it, it was an atmosphere of war. Cops targeted black youth specifically through new policies of, quote, law and order. Um, they were there to uh, effectively keep people in line. In the face of this, women across town, including the leaders at Columbia Point, began organizing more fiercely for better social services and treatment. Poor black mothers, a growing demographic in public housing because of urban renewal, joined up in a militant group called MA, Mothers for Adequate Welfare. At one point, I think their, their membership reached about 400 people. They were 
mothers from these sort of poorer communities who were relying on welfare um, to get by. Unfortunately, the welfare system was designed in such a way that it was meant to be uncomfortable for them, and it was an incredibly demeaning experience to collect welfare. For many of these mothers, they found armed guards at the welfare offices. They had a very, very long bureaucratic process to get any money from the state, um, and particularly when it came to proving their eligibility. Uh, mothers often find that they had very invasive sort of searches going on in their houses, um, claims of illegitimacy, which was a big issue as well. And just in general, it was a system that would demean people, it was a system that people were very unhappy with, and also the, the money that people were getting on welfare wasn't enough to get by. Um, there was no sort of, you couldn't live on the money that, that they were they're making through the welfare system. So Mothers for Adequate Welfare were set up in order to make the system more dignified, uh, to give dignity for welfare recipients, and to make it more effective. At Columbia Point, organizers in Ma were also some of the strongest community leaders. Try me, because you couldn't crack me. I'm, I'm Roger's daughter. Did they tell you, did they tell you, but they used to call my mother Sergeant Haskins? I know. Did they tell you that? <laughs> Dorothy Haskins and her sister, Amy Farrow, were constantly keeping peace out on Columbia Point. Here's Dorothy's daughter, Donna, again. They call my mother Sergeant Haskins, my aunt Officer Farrell. And any time um, someone did something out there, they would contact my mother. Emulating recent protests around urban renewal, the mothers used direct action tactics to get the attention of city officials. They begin very visible protests, particularly lock-ins. And this is really what will lead up to the events at Grove Hall, is that following in the, the footsteps of many of the other groups and, and urban renewal protesters who generally lock themselves in in order to prevent buildings being knocked down, etc., they would lock themselves in welfare offices, um, basically occupying them, making themselves very visible, making a lot of noise deliberately in order to, to bring attention to their movement. So that's what's happening in the lead-up to 1967. There were sit-ins across the city, including at the welfare office at Columbia Point. They would use other creative tactics, like pile trash on the steps of the welfare office. My husband was on, um, uh, he had gotten sick, and so he had green children. So he got on welfare. I believe we was, we was protesting for furniture from the welfare department, and um, for the clothing alone, and I believe that's what we were protesting for. Jesus, this computer, I wiped some of that stuff out of it. And um, so I, I was part of the protests. I was, we used to go and sit in at the welfare office. And I, yeah, I was part of that. And we did get that. We began to get furniture. We got better clothing allowances for the, you know, so we could buy more clothing off our kids. And so I remember that, yeah. In 1965, Ma staged a sit-in at the welfare department to demand that surplus food was handed out quicker. That was successful. In 1966, they marched on the state house to demand a better welfare system. Um, so through sort of 1965, 66, 67, we see them becoming increasingly active. They're really starting to gear up their protests, become very visible. And Mothers for Radical Welfare start making headlines in the Boston Globe and, and, and other sort of mainstream press. At this point, they're led by a Roxbury resident called uh, Doris Bland. She is a mother, she's, she's African-American, she's sort of from the community, fighting for the community, uh, and she's becoming very active, very visible, um, and really driving Mothers for Radical Welfare forward in the general direction that the, the civil rights movement's taking at this time. So it's, it's a very, very active movement. It's, it's all about direct action. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, like anything else, if you need something and you can't get no help, you have to fight for it, in a way of speaking. And I don't mean just fight, but get out and talk with people and ask them to help you. And we had mothers in the point that were really very, very good at that, that we really did a lot of work on the welfare rights, that helped a lot of people. At Columbia Point, welfare mothers were fighting for better daycare. Welfare wanted them to get off of welfare 
but they weren't coming up with no money for daycare for the mother's children. So when I got out there, I worked on that. We demonstrated, we marched, went into the welfare department and took that over. The welfare department, we marched over to Grove Hall and Hancock Street. Those were the two offices that covered Columbia Point and demand money for the mother's daycare, to pay the daycares, you know, people to watch their children. So we got that through. But other fundamental complaints were going unaddressed. Checks were often cut off without any warning, leaving families without vital resources and an unclear process to restore their benefits. Mothers accused social workers and welfare offices of making racist comments and treating women with disrespect. Protesters directed their frustrations at the mayor and other elected officials who displayed complete indifference to the issues going on in cities. It wasn't that he just didn't want to come to Roxbury. He just refused to talk with us because he's not going to do his job. The issue is, is out here. And that's where he is supposed to come, where the issues is. That is his job, that's what he's getting paid for. And he refuses because he refuses to do his job. Then in June 1967, we see them really step up the game even further. They decide that the, the peaceful sit-ins that they're, they're kind of working with aren't working quite as well as they would hope. So they decide to stage a weekend lock-in in early June of 1967. A group of mothers returned to Grove Hall this time to begin an overnight sit-in that they said wouldn't end till welfare director Daniel Cronin spoke to them. They entered the welfare office calmly and confidently. So we see them at this point at the Grove Hall Welfare Office uh, using bike chains on Friday evening as the welfare office is, is kind of getting ready to close up. They lock themselves in with bike chains. It's about 50 mothers and children and they're there for the weekend. So that's what really draws the crowd who um, start to go outside. I uh, would see a crowd of about 700 people uh, beginning to emerge on the Blue Hills Avenue where the Grove Hall Welfare Office is. Basically, yeah, there were, there were uh, hundreds of people kind of gathering outside as, as this protest was happening. Um, the Welfare Commissioner, uh, Daniel Cronin, turns up and basically asks to talk with the mothers for adequate welfare. Um, they wouldn't let him into the building for fear that the police would come in with him. When the mothers, calling from the window, demanded he speak with them from outside the building, in front of the growing public audience, he said no. Um, he refuses and basically orders the police to break down the, the, the doors to the welfare office, you know, smash the way through and break up the protest. Um, so the police do that, they get bolt cutters um, and they, they, they cut the bicycle chains that are uh, holding the doors closed and they move in. The deputy police commissioner, Joseph Saya, authorized force, saying, Get them, beat them, use clubs if you have to, I don't care, just get them out of here. <laughs> um, those words are not something you'd expect to hear about, you know, a group of mothers and children. Some of these protesters were pregnant. Um, he is advocating the use of incredible force for a peaceful protest. Some protesters shared their story on local news. Started the ride and ended the ride when they started beating on the women and children. And then the men start coming in through the windows to say to protect the women and children, and they start beating on the men. From one of the office windows, a woman screamed that the police were beating people with nightsticks. Demonstrators, including women, were dragged out. The police um, would be, we had their billy clubs out, and would be uh, just hitting us. This is Chuck Turner, who organized a lot with Mel King in the South End. He was there at the welfare office. It was chaotic. Yeah, but just a lot of kind of movement on different floors. I was on the first floor. There were others who were on upper floors. But the staff of the organization were, and then the police just busting in. By the morning, 1,600 police officers, including the TPF, armed with riot gear, arrived in Roxbury to retaliate against residents and demonstrators. I was arrested. I was beaten. I wasn't, no one was being held hostage. We asked them to stop and talk to us. 
or to try to, to persuade Cronin to to listen to our demands. We not, not only do were we completely ignored, we couldn't get an interview with Cronin. He refused to listen to to the women, the more. It's it, actually the demonstration would have been peaceful and could have been if the demands had been met. There just wouldn't have been any problems, but we were ignored and then attacked and uh, just trying to get things which people deserve, their human rights and their dignity. I don't think we're asking for anything that could not be granted, but they just refused to uh, give it to us. Then I think that the problem is that we ask and ask and ask and we're not given anything. And the only time that the man seems to do anything is when he feels threatened or when he feels that people are going to get out of hand and not going to obey his law and order. And we had accounts from community members who were talking about uh, seeing police officers lining the the roofs of, of the of the buildings along Blue Hills Ave with uh, carbine rifles. Uh, we have accounts of, of police officers firing up to 200 rounds over the heads of protesters. Um, and, and really what comes through as we look at all these accounts is generally just the feeling that this is a war zone. You know, you're seeing US essentially what is, you know, an imperial project in Vietnam. And you're seeing an imperial project at home as well in the streets of, of places like Roxbury or Watts or, or New York. Um, and many of the people at the time were calling this war. They were talking about the environment on the streets of Boston as if it were, you know, Vietnam or, or it were, in, in the words of one bystander, Egypt or Israel is the, are the examples that we use. So I, I think this was no coincidence at all. Um, it was a very definite sort of continuity there. Um, and the militarization of the police was just one part of, of the increasingly divided society and, and the increasing sort of, uh, you know, I use the term inter internal imperialism and, and that's, I think that's definitely what's happening here. I don't call that a riot, that was a rebellion against intolerable conditions. Black people are not treated like human beings, that's the worst and first of all. In second place, that even white people, the poor people, are not treated like human beings. This country is an oligarchy. It is not a democracy. It's the dictatorship of a few, the few rich and powerful over the many who are either poor or middle class and don't know any better. Police arrested 44 people in total, and 45 were injured. Rioting and looting continued for the next two nights over 15 blocks of Blue Hill Avenue. The brick throwing and looting in the Grove Hall section of Roxbury are over. The thud of police nightsticks is no longer heard along Blue Hill Avenue, which runs through Boston's Negro Ghetto. The TV station WGBH reported on the aftermath. The policeman is bringing all kinds of charges, inciting a riot, participating in a riot, uh, a fray, disturbing the peace, all these kind of charges. What kind of peace did we disturb? They came in, they started beating on us. Yet we was disturbing the peace. We were never told to leave the building. We were never, never told to get out the building. And then these are just some attacks. The police, Boston police force is rotten to the bone, the whole system, the whole power structure. And then they want to put it on somebody. Okay, like, uh, they beat us up. Now, don't you think this was great? Mayor Collins, Commissioner McNamara, and all them. Praise the police for beating up women and children. You did a wonderful job. You know, that's nice. Praising them. And, and yet we're talking about need for police force. They want police community relations. What they want? Police community relations so they can beat up the rest of the community. They don't take this note. They don't even want anything. It's just a whole, a whole put up job. The whole system is right. Collins, what is he doing? He's sitting down there in his chair and he's the same way. He's not coming out here, but he praised them for doing the work for him. He's afraid to come out here because he's afraid somebody will hit him. But if he had a billy club and a gun, he'd be out here too. Talking about beat him, beat him, kill him, kill him. Is it any justice in there? The Reverend Virgil Wood was also at the Grove Hall Rebellion. He was a leader of the Blue Hill Christian Center in Roxbury. He was also a lieutenant and confidant of Martin Luther King. I'd say it was a police riot on a people's rebellion. It was precipitated by the assault of the police. Now, the community has moved from simply uh, uh, reacting to what the police did now to bringing on what I think is a much needed revolution in terms of making their community the domain of their own decision making so that they will own, earn, learn, and control this entire turf. The rebellion is 
the movement of the people to get the man off our necks and off our backs, and that's in terms of economics, that's in terms of decision making, in other words, to get the control over the decision making and uh, to get in the driver's seat of our own community. I think we've got to get these cops out of every black community in America. Our community gets no protection, whatever, anyway. So the question of how you protect communities is not going to be resolved by the present system of, 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 of uh, that's now changed in the city. Every weekend, there are people who are beaten and kicked around and knocked around. And on the other hand, when people call to uh, have protection, they uh, just don't get the response. So that I have to say that the police force not only is a failure, but that it is an oppressive force in the community. We're sitting on a powder keg anyway. It's a plantation system where, where other people manipulate people's lives for profit. The uprising in Boston shocked the government into action. In 1968, Massachusetts increased its monthly welfare distributions from $250,000 to $3 million. It was a major win. But across the country, the urban rebellion showed no signs of letting up. 1967 um, and the actions at Grove Hall were the start of a, a long, long season of, um, of discontent, of action that lasted right through the summer of the long, hot summer of 1967, as it's often called. This is their community and this is the way they react to uh, police brutality. 67, you had two major ones and dozens and dozens of minor ones. We will be free by any means necessary. I think we've got to see that a riot and by 68, is the language of the unheard. When King was assassinated, 130 cities burned at the same time. Black people again took to the streets in Detroit, Washington, D.C., and Boston. Across the country, 39 people were killed, 35 of them black. The white America killed Dr. King last night. She declared war on us. The rebellions that have been occurring around the cities of this country is just light stuff. The king is... Bobby Seale, National Chairman of the Panthers, spoke. We are here as revolutionaries to let them know that we refuse to accept those political decisions that maintain the oppression of our black people and our people in the world. And so, 68, with all of these things, 130 cities burned, chaos was in the air. People did not know what was going to happen next. People's History is produced by Alison Bruzek, Rihanna Fernandez-Nunez, Connor Gillies, Rosie Gillies, Kainat Khan, and me, Alejandro Ramirez. Research help from Patrick King, Caitlin Rose, and Ed Hadley. Fact-checking and editing by Laura Fone and Bill Cunningham. Editorial help from Ben Shapiro, Alyssa Court, and David Wallace. Thanks to Naila Orr and the organist for letting us rebroadcast their piece on Radio Free Dixie. Our theme music is by Marissa Anderson, and our score is by Visitor, which is a project of Liz Harris and Ilyas Ahmed. People's History Podcast is an independent radio series produced by Jacobin. It is not related to the book of People's History of the United States or related projects. Special thanks to the Tamament Library at NYU and their archivist, Kelly Hayden, and to the Healy Library at UMass and their librarian, Jessica Holden. A People's History is presented by Jacobin Magazine with help from the Economic Hardship Reporting Project. Thank you for listening.